So morning all, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, in this session, we are going to learn about serverless databases. And that automatically starts up, automatically shuts down, and scales up, scales down, along with your application workload. So my name is Krishna Osarabu. I'm a senior database specialist at SA. And I've been with AWS close to a year now, uh, especially working with customers on Aurora and RDS PostgreSQL engines. And, uh, but I've been in the databases for more than 20 years. So I worked with Bloomberg for 12 years, Thomson Reuters for another 10 years. Started off as Oracle DBA, then on to uh, PostgreSQL engines. Last seven years, I've been extensively involved in open source engines, and also I've done some contribution to patterning for open source PostgreSQL. So if you see multi-synchronous standby support in Patroni, that's me. Right? So thank you very much. So let's get on to the presentation. I have joined here today with my colleague, Raj Jayakrishnan, who is also a senior database specialist SA at AWS. And we were colleagues. He is with AWS for close to a year. So we were colleagues in Bloomberg back then. So here is the agenda for today. So we're going to start with Amazon Aurora Fundamentals. So that enabled us to build serverless database. And then we are going to do deep dive into serverless v2. And then we are going to visit use cases. OK, what database workloads best suits for serverless? And then followed by demo and Q&A. So let's start with the fundamentals. Before we go into fundamentals, I would like to get a sense uh, from the room how many of you are currently using Amazon Aurora just you can raise your hand. So one, I would see. And how many of you are currently using serverless v1? None, I guess, right? So let's see. Uh, the serverless v2 is going to be a game changer. So I'm going to talk about very uh, use cases which enabled us, and as well as how it can scale your database compute without, without disrupting any workload, any transactions that are in progress, right? So let's start with the fundamentals. So I'm going to just quickly recap, just to set the context, right? So Amazon Aurora is a MySQL and PostgreSQL compatible relational database that, that's built for the cloud. So it offers the performance and availability of commercial databases with the, open, uh, with the simplicity and cost effectiveness of open source databases, right? And uh, so this basically, uh, a few of these architectural foundations, you know, that enabled us to build serverless, which I'm going to talk about in the next few slides. So at core, Amazon Aurora offers a decoupled compute and storage. So the storage layer, what you're looking at the bottom of the screen. Um, so let me see if I can use. Yeah, you can see it, yeah. So the storage layer, you know, which you're seeing in the bottom of the screen, is a purpose-built distributed, data, uh, distributed uh, uh, storage designed for cloud database. So the storage nodes are spread across three availability zones, right? And it keeps six copies of your data, two in each availability zone. And this will give you the best possible availability and durability and the performance. So with this decoupledness, we can able to attach up to 15 low latency read replicas. So they will help you to scale out your read intensive workloads in Aurora, uh, using Amazon Aurora. So the, lat the replication latency typically you see between the storage nodes is you know, less than 15 milliseconds, actually less than 10 milliseconds to be honest, even under very, very high transaction throughput. And this decoupledness also enables you to scale your database compute up or down, and as well as you can able to scale out into read replicas, uh, and up to 15 read replicas. So having said, uh, um, basically with this context, right, you know, with this particular architectural foundation, so let's look into serverless and how it can help you to scale out uh, uh, your production, critical production database systems. So databases are usually a crucial component in uh, entire application stack. So anytime you see regress to database performance, that means 
naturally it is affecting your application performance and sometimes the application availability. So therefore, it is very, very important for any DBA or any enterprise to look at and provision the database compute to handle their workloads appropriately so that they won't see any regression, right? So one approach majority of the customers take is to provision the database compute capacity to handle their peak workloads. But the problem is that, right, you know, often we notice the utilization is go underutilized. So what you're seeing here is the real world cases. So where the database capacity was provisioned to handle their peak workloads, but majority of the time it goes underutilized. So one approach you may take is to monitor your capacity periodically and adjust the capacity according to your needs. But the problem is, right, you need an expertise to continuously monitor, you need an instrumentation, you need tools, right? And then uh, scaling up, scaling down each time often leads to downtime. So that also you need to take into account. So this is where Aurora Savalis comes into play. So you don't have to worry about managing the database capacity and at the same time, Aurora Serverless V2 lets you scale your database compute along with your application needs, and most importantly, without disrupting your workload. So without further ado, let's look into Serverless V2. So Aurora Serverless is a on-demand auto-scaling configuration for Amazon Aurora. So, and in this configuration, your database capacity uh, is automatically adjusted based on your application needs. And, and, so, and another one is it's gonna scale instantly and in place, and it also offers you fine-grained increments when it scales. So what I mean by that is, you know, it basically looks at your application and gives the capacity, the right amount of capacity that's needed to your application, not to over allocate, not to under allocate. And in addition to that, it's going to offer you full breadth of Amazon Aurora features, including multi-AZ, and, uh, and for disaster recovery, Aurora Global Database you have, and all other uh, uh, full breadth of Amazon Aurora capabilities, including logical replication, so and so forth, right? So let's, and one thing I wanted to point out before I go on to the next slide is there is a lot of interest in uh, many industry work verticals across many workloads that they wanted to go serverless. So especially monitoring the capacity constantly, adjusting the capacity, it's a cumbersome task for any organization. So what, uh, so what they told us, they wanted to go serverless, but without disrupting the workload. So I'm gonna visit those three pillars which I'm gonna talk about in the next slide. One common theme we saw across many asks were they wanted to adjust the capacity immediately when needed. So application is running and it's using your capacity at the peak and I would like to able to allocate the capacity instantly. So we built instant scaling is one of the feature into Aurora Serverless V2. So when you run your workload, we don't have to wait for to find there is a scaling point, right? So the capacity will be adjusted instantly and in place. And the second feature we built in is the fine-grained increments. So as I said, right, when you allocate the capacity, so it's very, very important you allocate it the right amount of the capacity that's needed by the application. So if you over-provision, of course you're gonna pay for that, right? And you're not, again, you go underutilized. So which is another feature we built into is the fine-grained increments. So along with your application, depending on the workload, workload it's gonna scale along with that. So we even have a demo that we're gonna show how the scaling is gonna happen in our Aurora serverless. Yes, please. Yep, thank you. So the question was, how does it decides to uh, scale up? So there is a slide which I'm gonna talk about, the factors that are gonna influence scaling operation in a moment. So I'm gonna hold on to the question until we reach the slide. Right? And the third one, of course, is a production system. So if you wanted to use your serverless on production systems, so the key factors you're gonna look at is the high availability and disaster recovery. Right? So the fault tolerance is very, very important in, in any productionized workloads. So we are gonna talk about how our availability and disaster recovery works with serverless V2 in the next slides. So we actually 
this instant scaling by what we call it as in-place scaling. So this in-place scaling, as I mentioned, is a non-disruptive operation. So let's imagine you have hundreds of connections, thousands of connections to the Dasavalis database, and you have a large number of queries that are running on the database. And there are some inactive transactions, active transactions that are going on the database. And you want the scaling to happen without disrupting the workload. That's exactly serverless V2 does, right? And uh, your compute fleet is continuously monitored by a few uh, factors which I'm gonna talk about in next slide. And it's gonna perform the scale up or down to meet exactly the capacity needed by your application. So, and as I mentioned, right, not only the disruption, it does not drop your connections as well. So during the scaling operation, you do not see any connection disconnection. So it's gonna retain the connections while performing the scale up or scale down and without disrupting your workload. Finally, the scale downs. So the scale downs are a little bit complex, right? You know, when you're scaling up, you're giving additional compute, additional memory, networking, very easy. But when you're scaling down, you wanted to ensure that you're not flushing out the buffer buffers, which you just read from the memory. You know, maybe the buffers are required, you know, most frequently accessed. So there is a careful algorithm that needs to be put in. So what we do is underneath we use a combination of least frequently used and least recently used algorithm to identify the cold pages and we only evict those cold pages in order to reclaim the memory and shrink your memory back so that the scale down can go through, right? I'm gonna talk about that in the next second. So, so we talked about Aurora capacity scaling, right? Now let's talk about uh, the fine-grained adjustments. So in the previous slide, I mentioned uh, it is very, very important when you are, during the scale up, it's very important you, are, you adjust the capacity the right amount of capacity that's needed to your application. So if you over allocate, of course, you're wasting uh, the compute resources and you're paying for it without using it. So unlike V1, so with the V1, if you remember, the capacity is adjusted by doubling the compute capacity. The V2 adjusts your capacity in as little as in 0.5. So before that, let me talk about, uh, I mean, how the capacity is measured in Aurora Savalis V2. So the database capacity is measured in what we call it as uh, Aurora Capacity Unit, or ACU. And one ACU typically comes with a two gig memory and associated CPU and the networking. So, I mean, when you're looking at the uh, proportionate, you know, the CPU versus memory, imagine like, you know, you're using uh, the provisioned Aurora, the same ratio works in V2, right? And uh, so when you start, you can start with as little as 0.5 ACU, so which is about a gig memory and associated CPU and networking. And the starting capacity, and then when you are scaling up, as I said, you know, your workload is continuously monitored, and the scale up takes space in a fine-grained increments with as little as 0.5 ACUs. And let's look into the scaling factors. So the question you asked was, okay, what are the factors uh, it's gonna use to perform the scaling? So the first one I would like to highlight is um, uh, the scale up, scale up rate. So how fast it can perform the scale up? So that depends on the current database compute size. So the larger the database compute, the faster the scaling is gonna be. So in the next slide, I put together one of the key, contrib uh, key factors about what is the minimum and what is the maximum capacity. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. So the first one is the scale up rate, how fast your scaling is gonna happen. It depends on your compute size. So the larger the compute, the faster it's gonna be. And another factor it's gonna use is the CPU, memory, and networking, right? So you have a workload that's heavily CPU intensive. Let's say you are, uh, and you know you have multiple concurrent queries that are heavily using your CPU. And once you reach the threshold, it's gonna trigger your scaling up operation. And when the usage goes down, naturally, it's gonna start scaling down. And uh, another one is the memory. So you're reading large number of blocks into the memory, for example, and it sees the memory pressure, gonna trigger the scaling. 
And similarly, the network. Let's say I'm reading a large amount of data from my Postgres instance or our instance to your client uh, process. So if it's going to put any pressure on the network, which is going to scale up your compute in order to accommodate the right network throughput that's needed to your application. And the next one I'm going to talk about is configuring capacity. So when you, um, whenever you create Aurora serverless cluster, you're going to configure the capacity by giving the minimum and the maximum ACU. So the minimum is the starting capacity you're going to specify. So whenever, whenever it starts or when the instance is idling, that's the capacity you're going to see. And the maximum capacity is to handle your peak workloads. So let's assume that you know if I uh, any time you see the peak workloads requires you know this much of CPU memory, that's how you're going to adjust the maximum capacity, right? And few few factors I would like to highlight whenever you are giving uh, the minimum and the maximum capacity. So whenever you are defining the minimum capacity, so I always advise. So it's always tempting, you know, as I mentioned, right? You can start it as little as 0.5 ACU, but few things to keep in mind, right? You know, if you already have prior experience managing provisioned cluster, so look into your baseline metrics of provisioned cluster and see how the utilization of uh, CPU is, right? So based on that, arrive to your value, what's the minimum that's needed to your application? And also, if you are using any features like performance insights, so if you are using performance insights, my suggestion is always give two ACUs at least, right? Similarly, if you are using logical replication, for example, consider that because this ACU not just by your foreground processes, think like also required by your background processes. Anything you do, you are doing a vacuuming, needs additional CPU, right? Capacity, same thing. I'm doing a logical replication using any extension. So anything that's going to take up your database capacity form of CPU, memory, or I.O., anything, right? So basically the networking. So I'll consider that and arrive to a proper minimum ECU. And similarly, um, the replication latency. See, for example, which I'm going to talk about in a minute about the replication, but if you see any replication latency across your read replicas, so then probably look at, look at that and maybe add additional readers to scale out your reads or increase the capacity if needed um, for minimum capacity, right? And when you are defining the maximum ACU, and always, you know, maybe if you're on a tight budget controls, naturally, you're going to cap your maximum ACU usage, right? And when you're capping your maximum ACU usage, and if you see a need for improving the performance, naturally, you're going to, you can scale out one. All your reads can be scaled out into multiple readers in Aurora, which I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And the second one is, um, uh, the second one is, uh, uh, again, look back into your previous ex prior experience. You know, look into the baseline. What is your current peak, line, uh, peak workload is using your uh, capacity utilization it? And based on that, derive to your value. And third one is controlling runaway queries. So naturally, right, in any production systems, we've seen this in the past, even with commercial databases, right? So where the query plan gets regressed all of a sudden, and starts reading full table scans, large amount of data, and you want to control that, right? You know, so if I allocate more CPU, the runaway queries or the plans that are regressed are going to utilize my resources so much, unnecessarily I'll be paying for no reason, right? So you, if you want to control that, that's another way to derive your maximum ACU, how much you wanted to allocate, right? And if the, finally, if the usage is real, and uh, and from the baseline, you can see how the variance is, right? You know, based on that, you're going to give so that Aurora can scale in between. And the next one I wanted to talk about is high availability and rate scaling capability, right? As I stated previously, in Amazon Aurora, and including serverless v2, you can attach up to 15 read replicas to your storage layer, right? And uh, these 15 read replicas are low latency read replicas. We talked about you know, less than 10 milliseconds of latency. Typically, you're looking at under uh, 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 at the storage level, right? And, uh, and these read replicas you can use to scale out your reads, uh, and that way you can improve your application performance. So one piece I wanted to talk about is with Amazon Aurora, including serverless v2. So for any reason, if your writer node fails, it's going to automatically detect and fail over to one of the read replica. So the way it identifies which read replica it needs to uh, fail over to is through failover tier. So what you're looking at here is failover tier from 0 to failover tier 15, right? So whenever you define a read replicas in a failover tier 0 or 1, 
What happens in serverless V2 is whenever your writer node scales, your reader nodes in failover tier 0 or 1, they're going to scale along with your writer node. The reason for that is anytime, if, if things don't go wrong, you know, there is an availability zone uh, failure or the compute node failure in the writer node, right? So what happens is it's going to fail over when it fails over. We wanted to make sure that your reader node in tier 0 or 1 should have the right capacity what is being used by your writer node at the time of the failure. And the reader nodes in failover tier 2 to failover tier 15, they are going to scale independently, depending on the workload on that particular reader node. Um, so with that, I have a little animation which I have uh, put together here, which is going to talk about um, the multi-AZ availability and how the scaling happens in the reader nodes uh, in failover tier 0 or 1 or from failover. And also I have put together failover tier 14 and 15. So, so in this case, what you're looking at here is two endpoints, right? You know, cluster endpoint. And uh, so you have a cluster endpoint and you have a custom endpoint. So Aurora, serverless V2, and the provisioned Aurora, it supports three endpoints. One is cl cl cluster endpoint, as you can see here on the slide, which is always points to your writer node. And another one is, uh, actually, there is a reader endpoint, which is not in the slide. So there are the reader endpoint points to all your reader instance nodes. So underneath, it uses round robin DNS based load balancing. So whenever you are using the DNS endpoint, it's going to allocate a round robin DNS based load balancing for you automatically, right? And then there is a custom endpoint, which I, as I shown here. So the, you can create up to five custom endpoints in Amazon Aurora and also in serverless V2. And these custom endpoints, you can point to particular reader instance of your choice. So let's say, I, I mean, in this case, I'm, I, I'm assigning this custom endpoint to tier 14 and 15. I'm going to show you through custom animation here. So in this case, my application is, um, uh, my application is connecting to cluster endpoint, which is going to route to uh, the writer node here, right? And let's assume that it's using up lots of compute or memory or the networking, so which is going to trigger your scaling operation. And when the writer node scales, as I mentioned, your reader in tier 0 or 1 is going to scale along with the writer node, right? And here, the application that's working on tier 14 and 15 are not going to scale along with it. So they're going to scale independently. And uh, let's assume that the reporting app is using custom endpoint, and which is going to go through tier 14 and 15, and performing a workload significantly on both the machines. So in this slide, I'm, what I'm showing is it's scaling, both the machines are scaling up. But if for any reason, if that custom endpoint only performing lots of workload on tier 14 node, tier 14 node is going to scale up independently from tier 15. So, and another one is, you know, we talked about high availability, right? Now let's talk about uh, the disaster recovery. So Amazon Aurora offers you Aurora, Amazon um, uh, Aurora Global Database, so which is a feature of Amazon Aurora. And uh, this will let you uh, replicate your changes across the region with very, very low latency. The latency you're looking at it is less than one second here. And, uh, and underneath, it uses a dedicated infrastructure at the storage layer, which replicates your changes from primary region to the secondary region in less than one second latency, even under very high transaction throughput. And what happens with the global database is, you know, for any reason, if there is a disaster, and if your primary region becomes unavailable, you can fail over to secondary region in less than one minute. All right? So that's very fast cross-region recovery. Uh, uh, offered by Aurora Global Database. And the second approach you can, what you can do is, um, so in this slide, um, so there is one primary region, and I'm using three secondary regions. So Amazon Aurora Global Database, you can add up to five secondary regions. And in each region, you can add up to 16 uh, read replicas within the secondary region. So one is, while providing disaster recovery across the globe, you can also think like, okay, if you, they, if you have a need, you have an application that's scaling out globally, and you have a need, you want to scale your workloads across the globe. So what you can do is you can define this secondary region cluster, and you can attach up to 16 RAID replicas in each secondary region, and you can make your application 
perform the local raids. You know, if I'm deploying, let's say you have multiple EKS clusters across the globe, and uh, and the application running in EKS or any any orchestration which you are using, you can simply perform the local raids so it can give the best possible user experience that's possible using this topology. And the second one I would like to talk about is. Uh, um, a serverless global database. So let's assume that you have a provisioned Amazon Aurora and you wanted to create a disaster recovery uh, with a, uh, in a cost effective way, for example. Right? So what I mean by that is, one, you can use headless cluster. So what happens is, you know, when you use headless in a Aurora global database, you have the storage replication that's going on, but there's no compute attached in the secondary region. And at the time of the failover, you have to attach the compute and you have to perform the failover. So that's going to add up to your RTO and RPO requirements, right? You know, based on your RTO. As I mentioned, the RTO is typically less than a minute in Amazon Aurora global database. And with Aurora serverless global database, what you can do is you can create a serverless database on the secondary region and with the minimum compute that's possible. So you can, attach, you can give it like a 0.5 ACU, for example, right? And you pay only to the minimum compute what you assign on the serverless global database while the replication is going on in the uh, storage layer. Remember, the replication is at the storage layer. You're not paying any for the compute here, right? It's happening completely in a decoupled way, right? And the beauty is when the time comes and when the region becomes unavailable, so you can simply fail over to the serverless global database and, and at that time, your serverless uh, uh, compute instance automatically scale up based on your compute usage by the application. Right? So this is another um, uh, uh, helpful. So if you have any tight budgetary requirements uh, uh, and, and you want to imp uh, implement a failover mechanism to meet your RTO requirements, so this is another one you, know, you can use. And I wanted to talk about quickly the versions that are supported. So the major versions that are supported in V2 is version 8 for MySQL compatible engine and version 13 for PostgreSQL compatible engine. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague who is going to talk about monitoring and the use cases for Aurora serverless V2. I mean, we always think, right, okay, what workloads best suits for serverless? As I said, it's a non-disruptive, any workload you can use it, but so there are a few real world examples which he's gonna walk you through and followed by a few demos we set up for you to how to use the serverless V2 on production. So thank you, Raj, over to you. Thanks, Krishna. Performance monitoring is one of the critical component of any RDMS database. I really want to know what is happening in my database currently, what happened yesterday, and what happened two days before. Um, by the way, my name is Raj Vay Krishnan. I'm a database specialist solution architect at AWS. And AWS provides RDS performance insights, especially for monitoring your database. So what we do here is we collect metrics from the database and provide a rich dashboard across active, average active sessions. So just by looking at the graph, we'll know what is happening on the database. So it means every color coding is based on the load on the system. Say so for example here, right, the green color is the CPU and blue color is the IO. Looking at it, I saw, oh, no, okay, this particular time there is a peak IO is happening. This particular time, there's a lot of CPUs. And I can drill down to the level of SQL statements running at that particular period of time. And I can just take over the next step, whether a performance tuning of the SQL statements and what I want to do with that. And uh, Aurora Serverless V2 supports RDS performance insights. And uh, as Krishna mentioned, right, uh, for running Aurora Serverless or oh, RDS Performance Insights, you need to have at least two ACUs is a recommended uh, approach. And uh, one thing what you can infer from the graph is, um, especially when we are talking about the minimum capacity unit and the maximum capacity unit, and sometimes right, we tend to, tend to figure out what, how do we arrive at that number. Because this RDS performance insight is based on the average active sessions, it means how many active sessions are in the database based on that we are plotting the graph. So looking at that, I can see what is my current CPU, and if the graph goes above that, 
It means I'm using the utilization more than what I've allocated. So that kind of a gives an indication that your database is running at a maximum capacity, but even though you have a graph goes above that, it means the provided uh, maximum ACU is not sufficient. So that's a one of the way to look at it, to see how do I tune my capacity unit for the Aurora serverless V2. And uh, for Aurora serverless V2, we provided a, a couple of new metrics parameters. These are the parameters. I'm just going to go through each and every one of them in detail and how it's being presented and how do we make um, some information out of it. The first one I want to talk about is the serverless database capacity. And this is a matrix calculated based on the cluster level and also the instance level. In the cluster level, we give an average ACU across all the instances. And at the instance level, it provides an ACU of that particular instance, whether it could be a reader instance or it could be a writer instance. One of the advantage of looking at this graph is because as Krishna was talking about it, right, um, based on the workload, the ACU is allocated and we do a fine-grained uh, allocation. So by looking at the graph, we can see that, oh, this is how my workload is. So you can interrupt your workload based on the ACU allocation. The next parameter I want to talk about is the ACU utilization. Um, this is nothing but the percentage of the current allocation ACU with the maximum ACU. Okay, um, the couple of information I can figure out from here is, uh, for me, right, if I'm looking at it, if it's always running at 100%, it means whatever the maximum ACU I allocated for the instance is not sufficient. I may need to increase it because I'm currently running at my peak workload because of my AC utilization is always 100%. And next one, right, if I'm going to be running a reader instance, and the reader instance is always running at 100%, but my writer instance is a little bit less. So what I can infer from there is I need to scale my reader instance. It means my reader instance running at the maximum capacity, I need to add one more reader instance for my reader scalability. Okay. So with the graph, like latest parameters, uh, new parameters, we can infer a couple of, in because if you look at it, right, um, in the provision cluster, I need to provision the instance, what is the current size, but coming from the serverless V2, we have only two parameters to play with. One is minimum capacity, another is maximum capacity. So any other metrics which is going to be useful to decide what limit we want to provide, it's going to be useful. So these are the metrics kind of helps us over the period of time to allocate a proper number for those metrics. So we talked about, I'm just going to be recapping. We talked about Amazon Aurora fundamentals. We talked about serverless V2, in-place scaling, fine-grained, high availability, disaster recovery, and also the performance monitoring. Now you may be wondering, right, okay, future everything is, looks good. Where do I use it? What is a scenario I can implement this? I'm going to talk about a couple of use cases where we think that it's a very best fit for the serverless V2. The first use case is a multi-tenant application. Okay, this is like software as a solution or we call it as a SaaS. In this case, right, we may have hundreds or even thousands of users connected to the system and pretty much each and every one of them will have their own databases. That's what that's pretty much a software as a solution architecture is. So the ideal situation here is I want to have each and every user to have his own database that way I can have uh, isolation and also full control of, and uh, isolation of the level of control I can have. But that's not kind of a suitable solution, right? Because it requires a continuous monitoring and reshuffling the workloads and uh, doesn't provide the utilization or the efficiency. And on the other hand, I can do a little bit of trade-off. So I can allocate, co-allocate, couple of databases, say for example, I'm taking 200 users, 200 databases together and putting it in a single instance. So thereby, I'm effectively utilizing the resources, but there is a trade-off. It means I'm losing my isolation and also the granular control. Um, for example, if I'm taking a backup, 
I'll be taking all the 200 to 300 databases. And also, if you want to restore, I'll not be able to restore a single database. I may have to restore the whole set together. And uh, one thing is like noise, na noisy neighbor. I think you might have come, definitely come across this term, noisy neighbor. It means one application running out of control, pretty much killing other application running on the same instance. So these are the kind of a trade-off which we come across coallocating together. But using a serverless V2, we'll be able to provide the isolation what the application requests on also the control. It means I'll be able to provide every instance for all the databases, but I don't have to worry about the capacity. I don't have to go on monitor each and every database what capacity is running because uh, automatically Aurora Serverless takes care of it, either by scaling up or scaling down based on the application usage, individual databases can scale. So that is one of the best use case for um, SCA, uh, SaaS application for the, from Aurora Serverless V2 point of view. The next one I want to talk about is uh, enterprise application. Okay. I may have hundreds, even thousands of enterprise application, and uh, most of them will be backed by a database, one or more databases. And as you know, right, in enterprise, we'll be gen creating tons and tons of application, but some of them will be reaching an end of life. And some of them will be evolving application because so many users are using it and the more, more uh, funding is coming in and uh, it's getting bigger and bigger in size. Using and uh, managing that capacity of fleet is definitely a budget daunting. So using the serverless V2, we'll be able to provision those, not provision, we're able to provide those instances with the Aurora serverless V2 and uh, say, for example, if it is an end-of-life application and not many users are accessing it, so that will be running with a minimum capacity. If it's an evolving application with more number of users are coming, more activity going on, that will be automatically scale up. So I don't have to worry about which database to monitor, which database to increase the capacity. It's automatically taken care by the serverless V2. So the serverless V2 kind of handles the capacity for your database. The last one is scaling out database. This is one of the features just coming in recently. Not, I would say, reason, uh, uh, features, I would say design concept. It's a scalability. It means how do I move my, how do I keep my database in multiple databases? We call it a sharding because every database has a capacity limit. So, but how do I shard my database across a fleet of instances? Normally what we do is, um, there are two different approaches I can take. One is, I have my sharded database, or whenever I need, I can provision another database for my sharding application. But here the problem is, I have to reshard. Say, for example, I have a two instances where I have databases sharded. I'm adding a one more instance, but I need to reshard my existing data across the third instances too. Or I'll figure out how many shard is going to happen and provision all of them, but it's not going to be cost effective. So using Aurora Serverless V2, I'll be able to calculate what is my maximum sharding capacity. Okay, I'm going to have 100 shards of my data across over the, over the whole life of my application. I can provide the 100 instance in Serverless V2. So any data which is going to be spread across, which is actively used, will be using the capacity. Automatically, it's going to scale the capacity. If the data is not going to be used, simply it will be residing in the certain instance, but it will be using the lower capacity, whatever we design. So it kind of a flexibility, provides a flexibility of an application. How do you want to shard the data? How do you want to keep it without worrying about the management? Okay. So we talked uh, a lot about server, serverless. I just want to show you some demo. All the features what we talked about, right? High availability, scalability, read scaling, global database. I wanted to have a show the demo so that at least we can understand much better. And I have a recorded session which I'm going to be walking through in interest of time. This is how we are going to provision the cluster. It's very similar to how we do it normally in uh, Aurora database. I can use the create database. And as a part of the process, I'll be able to choose Aurora Global Cluster. 
and uh, two different options are available. One is MySQL and another is a Postgres. And it depends upon the serverless V2, the version is going to change. As, as Krishna mentioned before, right, MySQL is supporting eight and Postgres is supporting 13 and above. Once you choose the option, and everything else is going to be pretty much same. Like, okay, I need to provide the instance name. I want to do the username password. Everything is going to be same. Only thing which is going to be different is the instance configuration. In this, you have a new option called serverless. Okay. Once I choose a serverless, have to provide the minimum and a maximum capacity. Exactly like how much I can go low, how much I can go high. And other than that, which VPC is supposed to be provisioned to, and also what location security group. I'm going to be taking everything as a default and start provisioning the cluster. And the same thing like I'm doing it from the console, I can also do it from the AWS CLI. Now, if you're looking at, right, this is a normal console, what you see the database, only difference is I have an engine version is 13.6 and also the size. One thing which you noted down, right? Normally, size will be DB R6 X large, but here it is serverless. Within the bracket, I have my maximum capacity and the minimum capacity. Okay. Now, what happens is, right, after running over a period of time, I see, oh, max, minimum capacity point phase is not sufficient for my workload because whatever the factors which Krishna talked about it, right? So I need to increase it. It's just a matter of going and changing it and applying it. Once I apply, it automatically scales to the minimum capacity of four without disturbing the current workload or the current connection. So as I mentioned, right, there's the only two parameters you need to worry about serverless. One is minimum capacity and the maximum capacity, and both can be changed. Uh, the next one I want to talk about is the auto scaling. So we, we always tell, right, okay, it's going to scale along with your capacity, along with your capacity, but I just want to show in real how it scales with the capacity. For this, I have an application generator, uh, which is going to generate the load, a fictitious load, where it, I'll be using a Lambda function, and that Lambda function is going to be talk, connecting to the Aurora serverless V2, and I want to show how the V2 is going to scale based on my load generation. So this is the application which I'm using it for load generation. This is written in Python. And once the load is generated, I'm going to be mapping my load generation along with the ACO capacity. Remember, we talked about the cloud metrics. One of the cloud metrics is serverless database capacity. I'm going to be mapping here. So the green color is the one which is the order count, how many orders being created. It kind of typically represents your workload. And uh, the gray, uh, orange color is the database capacity. If you look at the graph, based on the workload coming in, it kind of goes hand in hand together in a fine-grained way. Means we mentioned like right, 0.5 is a capacity unit we allocate. So it kind of goes hand in hand together till we reach just the maximum point. Now I start my workload. But if you look at it, right, still my ACU is still allocated. The reason being, as what Krishna mentioned before, we scale up pretty fast, but we scale down carefully. The reason being, we want to make sure that when we deallocate the buffer or from the, from the memory pool, we want to make sure that it's not impacting the application. So we use different type of algorithm so that any application running doesn't have to go to the disk again. That's the reason it takes a little bit time for scaling down operation. But hardly if you look at it, right, just five minutes of time before the actual workload scale down and the ACU scale down. Okay. The next one I want to talk about is the read scaling. What is read scaling? We remember uh, when Krishna was talking about right, tier one, tier 0, 1, 1, and 2 to 15, that's a demo which I'm going to be showing here. Here, I'm going to be creating one reader instance with the one tier, another reader instance with another tier, and I want to see how the reader instance scales with the writer or independently. So here I have a three instance, two instances provider provisioned, or one is a writer instance with the serverless and a reader instance with the serverless. And uh, 
I'm going to be provisioning a one more with a different tire. I'm going to be picking up the tier 15 for this. Um, if you kind of recollect what we discussed a little bit before, tier 0 and 1 goes along with the writer instance and the tier 2 to 15 scales independently. So for me, I'm provisioning a new tire, which I want to show the demo, like how all of them together are working together. Here, if you look at it, right, tire, oh, sorry, uh, let me use them all. Tier 1 is a writer, tier 2 is uh, one other writer, and I'm using a 15. And uh, I'm using the same workload, and I want to show you how the scaling happens between the writer and the two readers. And the flash 01 is my writer instance. Flash 2 is my reader instance with the tier 1. Flash 3 is my reader instance with the tier 15. When the workload starts coming in, I can pretty much say that, okay, my writer instance obviously goes up because based on the workload. And uh, the tier 1 reader instance also pretty much follows the writer instance. The reason being, the tier 1 is the failover target. It means if anything were to happen to the flash 01, have to fail over to flash 02. So it means I want to have the same capacity of the instance running at that point of failure. I want to use it on my reader instead so that my application doesn't have any impact. And looking at the flash 03, right, it kind of scales totally different because um, the replication is going on, it has to take the replication, it has to write the information. That's the reason that's a little bit of ACU we can see it on the tier 15, but definitely doesn't match with what is happening on the writer instance. So this is one of the one of the components which want, I want like everybody to understand, like how the tiering number kind of makes a difference in terms of the scaling purpose. The next one I want to show is the high availability. Um, we talked about it, right? High availability, we are adding a reader instance. So for the two purpose, one is for uh, failing over, another is for the read scalability, okay? Here, uh, what I want to show you is like how we are going to have a mix and match configuration. It means how I'm going to be having a provisioned cluster. Provisioned here means um, um, say for example, in this case, right, I have a two provision cluster where it is dbr5 large. It means it's a normal Aurora cluster. We call it as a provision cluster for now. And I'm going to be adding a, another reader with the serverless to show you the mix and match configuration. And we can also fail over to the serverless. So this is a one of the way we can migrate. Say for example, currently you're running an Aurora, Aurora database with this particular configuration. If you want to migrate into a serverless, there's simply a matter of adding a reader instance and failing over. Uh, one thing, as long as the version supports. If you're running Aurora cluster with the 12 version, you may have to upgrade it to 13, and then you can add a serverless reader instance. So here, what I'm going to do is adding a, simply add a reader. At the time of reader, uh, remember when we talk about the instance configuration, where we can provision a serverless, I'm going to be choosing the same option and providing the minimum and the maximum capacity unit. Once it's provisioned, I can just fail over that cluster, which is currently a provision one, to the, scale, uh, to the serverless one, so that I can make sure that my current writer is serverless, or I can change my whole cluster to a serverless instance. This is the one which shows the mixed configuration and also the migration from a provision one to the serverless. Um, another thing is also, right, I can move from provision to serverless, but after running a serverless, if you don't like it, whatever the reason, because of your uh, workload is very constant, we can switch back to the provision two. So it's not like a one-way street. We can mix and match configuration, we can run it on the serverless, or we can also run it on the provision one. So I'm initiating the failover, So once a failover is completed, and I can see that my write ray instance is running on the serverless feature. Okay. The last one, um, yeah, for the, just for the timing, I'm going to skip the global database. The global database is very similar, where we're going to talk about the mix and match configuration. But uh, just for the time take, I'm for taking the question, I'm just going to be skipping the global database for now. So Krishna, would like to? Um, any any questions, please feel free. 
Thank you, Raj. So we just wanted to open up the floor uh, for any questions you have. So no questions, I guess. Oh, yeah, yep. please. Uh, uh -huh. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. <clears throat> so when, uh, the question was, um, how do you specify failover tiers when you're creating Aurora serverless or Aurora provision instance? So while creating the instance, you typically specify the failover tier, so from 0 to uh, uh, 15. And you can change it, actually, uh, even after creating the instance, too.